Often considered the pinnacle of the famous Rover company during its heyday years, the Rover P5 was a car that married classical 1950s styling with a robust and sturdy design that helped endear the timeless brand to a vast audience both domestic and international. A stately, luxurious carriage, but one that could be affordable to regular working families. The story of the P5 began in the early 1950s, when the Rover Company's flagship was the P4, a mid-sized luxury saloon that had been launched originally in 1949, but even at the time of its release, sported technology that was somewhat outdated, the main problem being due to the car's use of body-on-frame construction, rather than the emerging monocoque, wherein the body and chassis come down the production line together, rather than the former being added to the latter by a selected coach builder. At the time, Rover was under the management of director Spencer Wilkes, while his younger brother, Morris Wilkes, was chief engineer, having helped to introduce high-quality machines to the company's product lineup, but also being the driving force behind many innovative designs, including early prototypes for gas turbine-powered cars and the legendary Land Rover, a model that was originally envisaged as a stopgap to tide over the post-war steel rations, but would later become a brand of its own, revolutionising the market for utility vehicles across the globe. It was through the vision of Morris Wilkes that a new lightweight P4 was considered, the requirements of which were for it to be as well-built and refined as previous Rovers, but at the same time being cheaper to buy, with a proposed cost of £650, or £22,700 in 2021, while also presenting a fuel consumption of 30 miles per gallon, so as to be appealing during the post-war fuel rationing, this being achieved through reducing the weight of the car to a mere 1.2 tonnes. Through the joint efforts of Gordon Bashford and Robert Boyle, a monocoque-based unit helped to reduce the car's bulk, while the structure, which was hoped to be rigid enough to accept open coachwork, was designed as a single unit, with all inner panels such as the floor, front and rear bulkhead, and door, post-stressed, with the outer panels, which would be completely non-stressed skins, being simply bolted on, the door's bonnet and boot lid comprising an alloy construction. The Rover P5, aside from its monocoque construction, played host to many highly advanced features, including independent rear suspension and four-wheel Lockheed disc brakes, while other proposals for the design were front-wheel drive transmission, rear engines, the use of Dedeon axles, rear-mounted transmissions, four-wheel drive, and a car with a gearbox mounted under the seat. But sadly, none of these concepts came to pass, although many would later come forward on the Rover P6 of 1963. Unfortunately, amidst problems in developing a suitable engine, enthusiasm for the car's development had waned by 1954, much of this stemming from a lack of assembly floor space at Rover's Solihull plant, with proposals to extend the factory being denied by the local council, together with an uncertainty as to what segment of the market the car would occupy. The original concept of a high-volume, low-profit model that would be set below the P4 in the product range being replaced by a low-volume, high-profit car that would rival the Jaguar Mark 7. The comparatively small P5 was thus enlarged to make it a luxury saloon, with the suspension system being revised to incorporate an ordinary beam axle at the rear, but retaining twin wishbones and a laminated torsion bar, while the box section front subframe, which carried the suspension, steering, engine and gearbox, was also incorporated and attached to the rest of the vehicle by six rubber bushes. But despite this improving access for regular servicing, the subframe's addition introduced excess weight. With the direction now firmly changed as to what the P5 was expected to be, Rover designer David Back, who had joined the company in 1954, took an earlier facelift for the P4 and modified it to suit the new P5, and by April 1957, the styling work for the saloon had been completed, although attempts at creating a coupe model were slowed due to issues of excessive wind noise and the lack of a B-pillar which, while presenting a striking pillarless window akin to contemporary Cadillacs, reduced the structural rigidity of the roof, thereby requiring a full redesign with the B-pillar reinstated. For power, the original P5 was fitted with a 3-litre inline-6 unit brought over from the Rover P4, attempts at creating a dedicated V6 being dropped due to cost and production issues, the inline-6 engine providing 115 horsepower, giving the car a 0-60 time of 16 seconds, a top speed of 96 miles an hour, and a fuel consumption of 20 miles per gallon. After six years of development, the Rover P5 made its debut at the 1958 Earls Court Motor Show, but while its regal styling was praised, criticism soon mounted as to its noisy cabin, sharp gear change, heavy steering, and unimpressive performance caused by its 1.6 ton weight and underpowered engine. This wasn't to say the car was reviled though, the rear suspension gave passengers an unbeatable level of comfort, while back's layout of the cabin and dashboard blended modern ergonomics with traditional mahogany and leather, in order to ensure both practicality and luxury not dissimilar to that found on the contemporary Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud. This mixture of style and substance meant it was a shoe-in with corporate executives and managers at the heart of Britain's business centres, 
and gradual improvements to the machine, including the fitting of front disc brakes, revisions to the engine, and the introduction of a hydrosteer power-assisted steering, helped to amend some of the more niggling faults with the original model. These modifications, originally sold as the Mark 1A, eventually gave rise to the Mark II in 1962, which not only provided power steering, a rev counter, and four additional gauges as standard, but also introduced the long-awaited coupe version of the car, which, unlike traditional two-door coupes, retained all four doors, and was distinguishable by a lower, smoother roofline to give it a more sporty image. A problem that continued to plague the P5, though, was its choice of engine, the 3-litre inline 6 unit carried over from the P4 now being nearly 20 years old, and thus little could be done to improve the power output of the car further without requiring a major redesign. While proposals were made to introduce new 5- and 6-cylinder engines, based on the 2-litre inline 4 power plant used in the Rover P6 of 1963, a chance encounter between Rover's managing director, William Martin Hurst, and a discarded light alloy 3.5-litre Buick 215 engine at a boatyard in Wisconsin, led to the development of one of the finest engines ever fitted to regular family cars, and one that would see continued production for the next 40 years. The Buick 215 was first launched in 1961, as part of a series of all-aluminium V8 engines used to power a variety of Buick and Oldsmobile Y-body models, the normal engine finding its way into the likes of the Buick Wildcat, while turbocharged 200 horsepower versions were available for the Oldsmobile Cutlass, but cooling problems saw the 215 V8 dropped in 1963 by General Motors and replaced with cast iron units following coercion by the American steel industry. While attempting to sell Rover-built gas turbine engines to the Mercury Marine Company of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, William Martin Hurst, who was already aware of the Buick 215 power plant, found the discarded unit and saw that it was ideal for the likes of the P5 and the P6 due to its light aluminium construction and small size, and after lobbying to General Motors in order to release the rights to the design and tooling, the American firm finally relented in January 1965, and the Buick 215 V8 was brought to the UK, with Buick engineer Joe Turley providing direct consultancy at the Solihull plant. Demonstrating a weight that was 200 pounds lighter than the current inline 6 unit, the P5 was immediately shortlisted for the fitting of the new Rover V8 due to its wide engine bay. The main alterations made to the power plant, including the reduction of the max RPM to 4,400, and the inclusion of an improved manifolding with the twin SU carburettors and rocker shafts. Now christened the Rover P5B, the B signifying Buick, power output was increased to 160 horsepower, providing a 0 60 time of 11.5 seconds, a top speed of 115 miles an hour, and a fuel consumption of 19 miles per gallon, the engine being married to an automatic Borg Warner Type 35 gearbox, as this was the only transmission Rover could access that would suitably handle the higher power and torque. Launched in autumn 1967, the Rover P5B was put on sale at £1,999 or £37,120.21 for the saloon, and £2,097 or £38,900.2021 for the coupe. While the improved performance meant the car was now the perfect mixture of form and function, a superb blend of timeless classic styling and internal refinement with speed, performance and economy that didn't break the bank. The Rover P5B, therefore, was arguably the very height of Rover's success, with production set at 85 cars per week from Solihull, while the car also garnered the attention of many high-ranking customers, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II taking possession of several examples both from before and after the release of the P5B. Another famous appointment for the Rover P5B was as a ministerial transport, these cars being introduced under the first government of Prime Minister Harold Wilson in 1967, and would see use through the governments of Edward Heath, Harold Wilson's second term, James Callaghan, and finally Margaret Thatcher, who retained the P5B as her main transport in order to spite British Leyland and its then flagship the Rover SD1, the Thatcher government retaining P5s until around 1987, whereupon the contemporary Jaguar XJ took up the mantle. In 1967, following the departure of Spencer Wilkes as chairman of the company after 38 years of tenure, Rover decided that, in order to maximise on its success, it would join the Triumph Company under the Leyland Motors Group, which was controlled by Triumph chairman Sir Donald Stokes, but their prospective bright future was short-lived when, at the encouragement of then Minister of Technology Tony Benn, the Leyland Group merged with British Motor Holdings a year later to form British Leyland, this gigantic corporation that hoped to emulate the likes of General Motors in America bringing the Rover company under the same umbrella group as main rival Jaguar. Therefore, the firm was now selling far too many executive and luxury saloon cars for the market it wished to serve. Sadly, while Rover had established itself as one of the most profitable luxury car makers in Europe, with the P5B and P6 providing the UK 
with a potential equivalent to BMW in the form of luxury sports saloon cars, Lord Stokes, chairman of British Leyland, came firmly down on the side of Jaguar, and with the issue of too many luxury cars on sale under the BL Group, chose to axe most of Rover's potential replacements for the P5, many of which were nothing short of striking. The Rover P7, an initial evolution of the P6, gave rise to the P8 Executive Saloon and the P9 Mid-Engine Supercar, two machines that would have easily competed with Mercedes-Benz and Porsche for the luxury and sports car market, but both projects met a quick demise when Stokes, through the intervention of Jaguar founder William Lyons, prioritised the latter's own combined executive and sports car model, the XJ27, later to become the XJS of 1975. With the precedent now fully set that Jaguar would be British Leyland's luxury arm, while Rover would handle only executive models, the P5 stumbled on in production until June 22, 1973 with no direct replacement. The huge success of the recently released Range Rover, together with the loss of the P7, P8 and P9 projects at a cost of over £3 million, or £43.3 million in 2021, meaning that there were neither the funds nor the production floor space available to develop a new machine to immediately fill the void left by the P5, its place taken spiritually by the P6. In the end, the Rover P10 was developed between 1969 and 1971, this machine being evolved gradually into the Rover SD1 of July 1976, which replaced the P6 after 14 years of production, but was perhaps the worst victim of British Leyland's abysmal quality control and union strife. The car, despite winning the 1977 European Car of the Year award, struggling to garner much-needed international sales, and seeing the Rover name fall tragically from grace as higher-quality BMW, Audi and Mercedes products moved in to sweep up the company's tattered reputation. Thus, in the decades since the launch of the crowning P5B, Rover had gone from a mark of quality, refinement and innovation to a crippled shadow of its former self that was now left to languish in the face of its inevitable demise. <laughs>